Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Development Services Forum. Uh, we are here in June, which is both hard to believe because time has gone fast and not at all hard to believe because none of us wore jackets into work this morning. Uh, so uh, I hope you're all enjoying the warm weather. We know that we've heard from a number of members of the forum that we are in prime vacation season. So we are recording today's session so that more people will be able to see it. Um, the other thing that we'll mention is that we are taking July off uh, so that you all can go and I'm sure spend the vacation time that you'd like from 7.30 to 9 a.m. on a Wednesday morning in the middle of July. Um, and we will see you back here again in August. That said, I'm excited to introduce this morning's content. So uh, we actually have the Rethinking Mobility Transportation Strategic Plan back for an update with Ozzy Arce uh, kicking us off. And then after that, we will give a quick recap on the Blueprint for Success drafting. Um, and Ethan will be leading us through that process. And if you see me duck out, it's because uh, I'm wearing two hats this morning here and at Walnut Creek downtown. So you'll be in the capable hands of uh, Ethan Vindernagel, our planning manager as MC. So that said, thank you, welcome, and I will turn it over to Ozzy. Awesome. Do we have a mic set up beyond this one, or it's just? Awesome. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Jessica. Uh, my name is Ozzy Arce, a transportation planner here with the city of Walnut Creek. I was here a few months back uh, where we dumped a bunch of data on you all about ex existing conditions report um, around transportation. So I just wanted to follow up with you. Um, on where we are in the process, we're now in phase three, which is called the strategies report. Um, I also have Carrie here from Fair and Pierce who will be leading most of the discussion this, this morning. Uh, just a quick refresher, uh, last time I introduced this concept of a transportation demand management strategic plan, which is a grant funded project, which has uh, three objectives. One, to reduce our dependency on the auto and manage parking. Uh, to encourage these notions of active mobility, such as biking and walking, and then lastly, uh, promote this idea of transit first. Uh, because most folks don't really understand this concept of what transportation demand management is, we rebranded the effort to be called Rethinking Mobility. Uh, again, quick refresher, the, the uh, project has uh, five phases, and uh, Last time, again, we presented the ex existing conditions report that has those nine parts. Uh, but where we are now is uh, phase three, which I'll touch on in a bit. But before I move on, I want to touch on the community outreach, which we've done uh, since the last time I visited. We did a targeted social media campaign, which you see on the very left. Uh, on the very right, we did a newsletter to the interested parties list, which is near 200 individuals. And then in the middle, you see a map, which has several points um, and this map was, was located on the project website, rethinkingmobilitywc.com, and it allowed folks to pinpoint specific areas in the city that require infrastructure or uh, just a, a, a changes in terms of improvements for our streets, sidewalks, and the like. Uh, in addition, we had the opportunity to go uh, do some street level engagement. On the very left, you see the uh, downtown, uh, uh, Walnut Creek downtown's first Wednesdays, uh, where we asked folks around uh, parking and parking uh, priorities. And on the right uh, was in front of the coffee shop uh, during a Friday lunchtime between 11 and 2. And just really quick, I'd like to uh, identify what the questions were asked. And sorry that these are a little smaller, but um, I'll explain what they are. The first one is simply a question around how long did it take you to find parking today? And there's a sliding scale that moves from the very left, which is right of way, to the very right, which says felt like forever. And what we understand is that, not super scientific, but what we understand from a quick glance is that most folks were able to find parking right away or within a, a couple minutes. Um, and, and obviously a few folks uh, felt like it was forever. Um, and, but what we understand is what are our perceptions around our thoughts around parking and parking management. And even just at a quick glance, maybe the case that um, you know, most folks that are frustrated are on the right side. And these are the folks that typically email counsel, right? I got a parking ticket or, and the like. But folks on the very left 
um, don't typically email council. You know, they're not the ones that say, hey, thanks for that free hour of parking. Um, and so, so that, not super scientific, but, but interesting nonetheless. Um, the second question that we asked around parking and parking management was, what's most important to you? And we gave folks one sticker, and we asked them, on the very left, there's availability, which speaks to any space available upon arrival anywhere. Uh, affordability speaks to price and convenience speaks to being able to find a parking spot but in front of the place I'm gonna patron. And then other, uh, it's just some interesting finding was shaded parking. But nonetheless, um, not, again, not super scientific, but at a quick glance you can tell that priority folks, um, it's really around availability of parking. So that's just a, a couple of the, the street level engagements that we've, we've had an opportunity to do recently. Um, in addition to uh, street level engagement, we collected a lot of uh, online comments, uh, mainly around uh, connectivity and safety, bike networks, ped, ped connectivity, safety improvements, and the like. Um, we've gathered so much traction that the San Francisco Business Time uh, did a story on the effort, the Rethinking Mobility. And the whole point of the story was, you know, there's a lot of cities that kind of fly under the radar in the Bay Area that are doing a lot of great things around transportation and parking management. So I encourage you to check out that article as well. Um, but today, uh, and really the meat of the discussion is on the phase three of the project, which is again the strategies report. And you have a copy in front of you, um, but it's also available online. Um, and what this is, is a, a list, it's a long list um, at that of potential strategies that can be used, that we can utilize to then move into the draft plan. And what we want to do tonight, which is what Carrie will lead the discussion, is present these strategies and then give you an opportunity to go back to your groups, uh, present the strategies report, digest the information, and then provide your comments, whether through us or whether through the, the survey that was launched also this week. So without further ado, um, I think I'd like to pass it on to Carrie to go over uh, the strategies, but before that, um, some of the guiding principles and frameworks to help us shape um, and filter some of these strategies. So thank you. Thank you, Ozzy. Good morning. Um, as Ozzy said, I'm Carrie McNichol. I'm with Fair and Peers, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you guys about um, really a lot of information that we're going to throw at you, but I have the utmost belief in your, your ability to digest it, and we'll have a little bit of discussion and hopefully provide some insight for you too. Um, as Ozzy mentioned, we got a lot of information from the last phase of the project, the Needs, Opportunities, and Challenges report. A um, lot of public comment, a lot of feedback. So we needed to do something with that and, and kind of figure out a way to make a framework to have this all make sense. And so that is where the guiding principles came in. These came directly from that, um, that outreach from feedback from the Transportation Commission, the Planning Commission, and the public as a way to provide a framework for the, the plan moving forward. So the biggest thing that, that, that I would say defines these overall is the idea of being sort of ambitious but achievable. The city wants to make an impact, but they want to have it be something that happens in the short term, ideally kind of within a, a next five years time frame which really kind of changes the framework through which we look at a lot of these strategies. Um, they need to be measurable things. We want to know how we're doing. How do we know we're doing a good job? You know, if we're investing in these changes, if we're investing in technologies, whatever it might be, how do we know we're doing a good job? Um, recognizing big ideas, not being afraid to go after some of those more ambitious things rather than just only going after the low-hanging fruit. Um, recognizing, too, that, that we want to focus on providing choice we want carrots, not sticks. We want to go after things that incentivize people to change how they get around as opposed to you know, what could be seen as forcing them or, or penalizing them for something. And then also recognizing that there's, there's some changes happening. The Walnut Creek is becoming a little bit more urban in nature. There are behavioral barriers that might happen. It's hard to get people to change what they do. I, I think probably most of us got in a car and drove here today. And could we have maybe made another choice? Well, it's going to be 100 today, so maybe not. But <laughs> um, And then focusing on um, how to, for parking specifically, how to manage the existing supply. Focusing on the investments that the city has already made in things like transit, in things like new parking technologies, and building upon those. And then lastly, recognizing that there are some limits. We've got regional challenges in the, in the terms of cut-through traffic, in terms of 
where people have to go to find work and how they have to get there. And suburban development. Those are always going to be neighborhoods that are a little bit more auto-centric. So on to the strategies report. So from those guiding principles, um, we looked at what the different types of trips were that people were making within, within the city. And we categorized, categorized those mostly into four different buckets. So work trips, non-work trips um, for recreation, for leisure, uh, trips to schools, the pickups, the drop-offs, and that could be students as well as kind of the faculty and staff, and then uh, parking-related strategies. So again, there's kind of some nuance to each one of those, right? So commute trips could be within the city of Walnut Creek. You know, you live here, you work here. Maybe you're coming from the East County. A lot of people come from the East County to work in Walnut Creek. Or you're going from Walnut Creek to, say, San Francisco or other places in the Bay Area. For school trips, as I mentioned, we've got students, which are going to be different, kind of a different need base than the teachers or the staffs. Most of eighth graders, I hope, aren't probably driving themselves to school at this point. Um, Non-commute trips to the core area, to other big commercial areas, and then parking. How do we manage parking for downtown employees, downtown businesses, as well as their patrons and people coming down here for fun, for recreation? So the strategies overview um, goes through each of those kind of four buckets. Um, and then briefly before I move into that, I do want to, to say briefly, so this is what's known as a TDM or Transportation Demand Management Plan. That's really jargony for a lot of people who maybe aren't super familiar with that terminology. And so just to give you a little background, that's looking at those behavioral changes. That's looking at how do we take the infrastructure that exists already or that's in place and build on top of that with programs, with strategies, with um, augmentations to actually have an impact in shifting people away from drive alone trips and helping to meet the goals that the city has set forward in a lot of its policy documents. So the strategies as we went through and kind of thinking about what those guiding principles are, um, we've categorized them kind of in three different ways. Our check marks are those that are recommended. Low hanging fruit, easy, makes sense, low cost to implement, possibly a big impact. They kind of check all the boxes pretty readily, sort of no brainers. Um, the plus sign is they're recommended, they might have a big difference, but they might be a little more expensive. They might require a little bit more coordination with other agencies or, or different groups. And then our lightning bolt ideas. Big ideas, but a big impact, possibly a big change in how business as usual has been happening, possibly a big investment, maybe m things that are a little bit more outside of our control or possibly even kind of outside of that five-year time horizon that we're looking for. So we wanna make sure we kind of consider a balance of all of these moving forward. So going into kind of those buckets of strategies, um, and there's a lot in here. As Ozzy said, there's, there's 50 in the report, and we've tried to kind of distill that down, and I'll pull out some themes for you. Um, but I would encourage if there's a particular area of this that you are interested in, um, we have a lot more detail on kind of the how of each of those in that report, and please feel free to ask questions at any time. So the commute trip strategies largely focus on those kind of more traditional, what's known as TDM strategies working with businesses, working with employers. Those strategies could be things like devoting um, additional city resources to promoting what already exists through groups like 511 Contra Costa. Um, working with Walnut Creek employers to make sure that they know about what those programs are um, and that they're promoting them or, or establishing their own for their employees. So things like making sure they, they have a carpool matching program. If a, if a staff person has an emergency, how are they gonna get home that day? and maybe that's a barrier. Maybe there's something they can do around transit or bicycle amenities. So focusing on, on letting employers know about what exists already, which there's really some pretty robust options. Um, forming a TDM, or S Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee. So basically the group that would look at this plan and make sure, yes, we're implementing it. That would be kind of the accountability um, piece for this specific plan moving forward. And on kind of the more aggressive side, um, considering possibly forming a citywide or district-based transportation management association. These are fairly common um, in other areas. Sacramento has one for almost every um, sort of pocket of neighborhoods there. A lot of other Bay Area communities have them. They're often found around business parks. So Shadelands, for example, might be a great candidate for what's known as a transportation management association. They often function in conjunction with um, PBIDs. So you've got 
a dedicated staff person who, at least part of the time, is whose his job is to promote those strategies, do things on the ground for their community that will shift some of those trips. Um, moving into some of the more kind of aggressive strategies, um, looking at requiring TDM programs for new commercial developments. So those that would maybe generate, for example, over 50 new ve net vehicle trips. Um, looking that when those businesses open, those business parks, those commercial groupings, that there are strategies in place already when they open. Um, that the bike racks are there, that the, the transit facilities might be there, that the knowledge is there around those programs. And then, again, I'm, as I mentioned before, uh, a big portion of the traffic that happens here, and, and I know this has been a hot topic for a lot of people, congestion on, on Ignacio, things like that. A lot of that, the, a lot of the employee base here is coming from Eastern Contra, Contra Costa County. So what can we do to perhaps enhance the frequency on those express routes, making it more like a bus rapid transit system to move those people and hopefully incentivize them to get out of their cars? Any questions on, on the commute trip strategies before I move on? And we can come back to those too. Okay, so school trips. I won't talk a lot about this, but this was um, a, an important piece of feedback that we got particularly from the Transportation and Planning Commission. Um, anybody live near a school site? Familiar with the uh, morning, yeah, yeah, the craziness of the morning drop off and pick up times. Um, hopefully better for you this week, I think now that summer vacation has kicked in. <laughs> it definitely was for me. Um, but so looking at things that we can do to minimize that chaos around the, the, the 8 a.m. kind of 3 p.m. time frames. So expanding the Safe Routes to School program that already exists that Contra Costa, Contra Costa County runs um, to be focused more and do more here with Walnut Creek Schools. Um, facilitating a school pool program. So much like carpool programs exist for, for grown-ups and for adults, this would match parents to help get students to school. So that you've got, you know, if you've got it's kind of formalizing what I think a lot of parents do already, but encouraging it and promoting it more and helping them get to know those other parents in their neighborhood that they could share drop off and pick up duties with. And then possibly making it easier for those parents to then take transit or do something different with their trip. Um, and then kind of on the lightning bolt big idea side, um, developing a school bus program. If you've got those kids on transit, then that eliminate need, eliminates the need for the pick up and drop off altogether, right? Um, developing a free student transit pass, particularly maybe for high school age students. So non-commute trips, this is kind of the, um, these are the recreation, these are the things that aren't just your daily kind of slog to and from work. This is, could be for fun, this could be for um, going out to dinner, it could be for arts and cultural events, it could be for um, service appointments even too, you know, going to the doctor, going to the dentist, whatever that may be but typically those shorter trips kind of held within your own community. So strategies in this category look um, a lot at the new mobility, quote unquote, options. So electric bikes, um, electric scooters, uh, car sharing programs. And these could also be considered for um, subsidized memberships or pricing either as a way to sort of kick off these programs and get people to try them off or as a way to benefit um, possible lower income or kind of equity communities that, that may have trouble accessing those services otherwise for financial reasons. Developing and adopting an active transportation plan. So as opposed to doing a separate bicycle plan or pedestrian plan, um, active transportation plans are becoming a lot more common in communities to look at those things holistically. Um, so as the city updates those documents, they may consider doing, doing a comprehensive ATP instead to provide that more holistic view, um, which would set them up nicely for possibly some grant funding as well. Um, on the development side, um, possibly similar to the commercial developments, looking at TDM programs, specifically for new multifamily re family residential developments. Again, those bigger ones that are gonna have more than 50 um, net new trips. The time when most people are willing to consider changing how they get around, getting back to kind of that behavioral barriers thing, it's when they start a new job or when they move, move their homes. That's when they're looking at, okay, shoot, how am I gonna get around? I've, I've got this new apartment I'm living in, I've got this great new job, I need to be able to get there, how do I do that? So having those resources on site, um, particularly in, in multifamily residential developments, um, can be really effective. I've helped set some of those up before and that's when we see people most likely to really make the change um, in how they get around. On the more kind of lightning bolt side, um, looking at 
providing for a smile, last mile, um, and gap coverage programs through um, transportation network companies. So the, your Lyfts, your Ubers, the ride sharing services like that. Um, the city has the existing senior Lyft program. So is there a way to maybe expand that or augment that that gets people that last jump so they're not having to maybe drive all the way to the BART station or not drive all the way to, to the express bus or things like that? And then continuing to keep track on, on all this new mobility stuff. Are the robot cars coming? When are they coming? What are they going to do to our roads? <laughs> kind of a lot of the, the hot topics that are out there right now. But having an approach for that so that, so that the city is ready and can continue to be at the forefront um, when those things come. Okay, parking, the last kind of big bucket. Um, and this one has a lot in here, and I will try to not get too in the weeds. But um, the sort of check mark strategies, um, we got a lot of suggestions from people around time and price changes. Again, none of these are, are hard and fast things that we're definitely going to adopt. They're just things to start the conversation and consider. Um, so what can we do around possibly, and the goal here with parking strategies, I should add, is that the city has an existing 85% um, occupancy goal. And that number is that so there's, there's enough parking, but you're, you're not having to do that thing where you circle the block time and time again, causing emissions, causing congestion, so that there's always at least some availability um, for people when they come to look for parking, um, particularly in the municipal garages. So looking at extending meter hours later into the evening, um, eliminating time restrictions, maybe letting them go a little earlier, letting them go a little later, so that they match with some of the private garages um, in, the, in the core area too. Pricing parking by demand. Um, it, you can do demand-based pricing, so it's a little more expensive during the busier times and less other times. So again, a possible revenue opportunity. Um, someone suggested eliminating the free Wednesday evening parking. I've gotten some head nod nose immediately <laughs> on that when we presented it, but you know, things that are worth considering, right? Um, and then looking at curbside management. So we've got, you know, let's say 20 feet of curb space, 50 feet of curb space in front of a business where people are trying to walk, they're trying to park their bikes, they're trying to get dropped off by a lift, the business is trying to get deliveries. So how do we best manage you know, that very small amount of space for the best use? On um, kind of moving into the plus mark side, um, looking at possibly um, increasing the cost of monthly parking permits in garages or developing alternatives for employee parking, um, giving them possibly parking cash outs, um, giving them more incentives to take transit or to not drive, again, making sure that we have those options available for them before we do that. And then looking at um, what the parking enterprise funds can be used for um, to reduce the demand on parking. So again, investing in those other options as opposed to just going directly to increasing parking supply. Um, it's not cheap to build a parking garage. So are there ways that that, that money could go a little farther by trying to reduce the demand? Um, on the lightning bolt side for parking, a uh, lot of text on this slide, I apologize. Um, offering peak parking discounts, um, off-peak parking discounts in garages. Um, so it, providing a discount for people who maybe are arriving before 7 a.m., after 7 p.m., in those windows where um, there's not as much demand on the parking. Um, allowing or requiring unbundling of parking in the core area. So when a business or home um, they're or apartment complex, they're not required to purchase parking as part of their lease price. They can, they can do that as a separate thing and then really have to think about whether they want that in there or not. Um, Reviewing and modifying the parking requirements for new development, again, support kind of based on some of the stuff we touched on before, to make sure it's matching with what the, what the parking goals of the city are and the TDM goals of, are of the city. Um, modifying the one-to-one -one parking replacement. So when a downtown lot is developed currently, there's a requirement that exactly the same amount of parking go into being replaced there. Maybe that's not necessary anymore in today's kind of day and age. Um, and then utilizing opportunities to share parking resources, um, possibly offering a residential pass program for um, as, as there's more residential coming into the core area, giving them the opportunity to park within those municipal garages in the nighttime. So all of this that I just flew you through um, before probably even your second cup of coffee for the day is also available um, at rethinkingmobilitywc.com. So that is the project website information on all of the previous project phases can be found there. 
um, as well as a survey which we launched this week. Um, so all, you can go to the survey and you can go through and check support, neutral, do not support on all of these. We've got a lot in this report and it's, it's in order to be actionable, it's gonna need to be distilled down and your feedback as one of the stakeholder groups on this project is very important as part of that process. Um, so we, we want, we're cognizant of it, that it's a lot of information, but we wanna make sure that, that, it's, um, that we're getting feedback from everyone to make sure that the strategies that we do move forward, um, which will be developed in more detail, how is this actually gonna work is a question we get a lot. So once we hone in on what those are, um, we'll put together detailed implementation ideas for each of them so that it is really an actionable kind of measurable plan moving forward. Um, with that, open it up and turn it back over to Ozzy. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, like Kerry said, I know that that's a lot of information. We just wanted to, to present at least the, the higher level uh, ideas. But again, please have the opportunity to share that report with your groups. Uh, the survey is open uh, through the end of this month. Um, and we want to, again, f uh, filter these down to move uh, some of these strategies onto the draft plan. Uh, so we have some time on this phase. We're going to also present it to other stakeholder groups, uh, including the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Walnut Creek Downtown Board, as well as do a, another joint workshop with our Planning and Transportation Commission at the end of July before we package all of this and present it to City Council. So um, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions, either specifically about the strategies that we presented, the process, um, or anything. So we appreciate your time. Thanks. Yes. Um, oh, there's a mic for you, too. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was interesting and seeing the, all the items, and I'm sure you have looked at this, but in my experience, there are certain things that it didn't show up there. For instance, schools. The school, many schools in Lafayette are doing traffic management plans. So that made a big difference when they worked out a system that drop-offs, they don't come in and stop and park and wait and clog the whole streets up. So they moved that, the people through and if the kids are ready to be picked up, then you can go in and get it, get the kids and, and you move through. Now, one of the problems is that the schools are short of funds. So I don't know if there's any help from the city to you know, provide some financial help to have those people working and moving that traffic through so you don't have that streak uh, backed up. Another one is on the offices, uh, the flex hours. And you know, we'll say if they're starting at eight, and now a group of them will start at nine, which then they work longer, and that reduces the load. And I'm not sure if there's any incentives for a company that provides that, that the city would uh, assist or anybody, you know. So those are things that beyond just the, when you list all these things, there's some responsibilities of companies and schools and other people that can help quite a bit. I hear you, and I think that, that really speaks to the city's role in encouraging or, or working as a partner to encourage them to promote these type of programs. I'm glad to hear that some schools are getting into the long range transportation planning. Um, and if it comes down to resources, I think that speaks to, uh, I think under the schools uh, strategies, there was one about sh sh the city sharing resources to encourage those type of programs. So short answer is yes, I think that's the conversation the city has to move forward and whether or not um, it's the city that's promoting it or the school that's promoting it, um, either way, I think it's a win. So I think Carrie has some more to say. Yeah, about. Ozzie pretty much nailed it, but, but those are, are definitely the kind of things that would be considered sort of under the header of some of these too. So for example, in encouraging um, employer TDM programs, flexible work schedules is huge. That can make a huge difference. You're right on the money, you're hired. <laughs> um, and then again, with the kind of the, the traffic management, um, safe routes to school programs can look at that too. And kind of what are the low cost um, ways that a, a school might be able to even just like with cones or even through parent volunteers sometimes, that can be a really good way to do it too. So in some cases, I think just getting um, those ideas planted in the school districts and s different school sites kind of minds on how they could do it will be really important. Any 
know, and I will say the city has a, a goal in its general plan that speaks to being a role model as an employer for TDM programs. And it does already do the flex schedule for its own city employees and how can we show other employers in our downtown or other uh, employment areas that these are programs that, again, incentivize, there's that carrot idea. Um, but again, one of the other strategies was looking at the city's own employee travel program and, and is there a way of being a leader in that space as well? Yes, Heather. I think there's a mic coming your way though. Uh, for next steps, when you put the plan together, is there going to be metrics in it? Or how do you know what success looks like? Are you guys thinking about that next piece? So in the interest of not putting you all to sleep immediately after you got up, um, we do have plan targets that are preliminarily identified in, in the document that are around the general. Um, and we, we went through these at, a, at the Transportation Commission and Planning Commission workshop um, that are generally around um, increasing the share of bike and walk trips, um, things like that. But each of these strategies that we move forward, the goal is for them to be very measurable. So in the plan, we'll have, um, you know, what are the things that you can look for that will indicate this? Um, and then some of the strategies that I didn't really touch on as well also speak to that in terms of data collection. Um, the city doesn't currently have data on school trips, for example, to go back to that one. So that might be um, an important strategy to consider moving forward is how do we track um, what data do we need, what processes do we need to set up um, that maybe we don't have already to enable that, that measurability. So great point. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, how do we make some of the bigger, more cost costly improvements, for example, um, bike, protected bike lanes, you know, uh, uh, improving pedestrian uh, sidewalks and um, uh, maybe even scooter access along major corridors like Oakland Boulevard, like California and cutting through Alpine, California up to the BART station and even Ignacio Valley Road. Um, scooters could easily go up and down that, I think, connecting Shadelands to the BART with the right investment in infrastructure. I know there's many challenges to getting there in terms of private property ownership and um, other things, but you know, can you talk a little bit to what the current implementation plan is? Um, is it a cost-neutral one to the city where it's focused on development paying its own way for those types of improvements with each new project, or are there grant programs and ways for us to take on more holistic improvements uh, in, a, in a bigger way? I, I mean, I, I, ideally, it'd be a combination of both. I think if there's a strategy that speaks to multifamily TDM requirements, so I think there's an avenue there to have a conversation with developers around providing that, those facilities, or um, in the context of, for example, SB 743 and creating this, I know we've had a conversation around VMT fee bank to provide then for those type of facilities, that I think is a, is, is, is a step in the right direction. And so yes to potentially having the conversation with developers under the umbrella more of I think SB 743 and moving into VMT, but they're very much a part of that conversation. I think the next place that I think the staff should look at is obviously the grant resources. I think the city though does have a challenge where a lot of the grants that are available sometimes focus on communities of concern or uh, they're targeted uh, lower income areas, rightfully so. Um, however, it's just a matter of how competitive is the city for these type of grants. And if not, then that's a conversation with our public works about where and how we invest in our, in our infrastructure and how can we implement it through our capital budget and our capital improvement plan. So I think a combination of both, really. I'd also quickly add to that, that um, if you look at the North Downtown specific plan, which is winding its way through uh, the approval process, uh, Planning Commission recently recommended approval to City Council at one of their recent meetings. One of the focal points of that plan is the east-west connections from the Iron Horse Trail to BART, getting people through, not by car. What are the pedestrian, what are the alternative modes of transit we can use to get people through from east to west, through the city, through the northern end of the city, to the BART station? So there's also just strategic planning, uh, a role for strategic, strategic long-range planning as well. So it's, I think it, to Ozzy's point, to reemphasize it, it's a combination effort. 
Uh, we're, not, we're not turning a blind eye. We don't think to any strategy or plan or, or op option in particular. Uh, we're trying to be comprehensive. And, and resources is one thing, um, but again, public support is the other. And if we have an example for of Lincoln Ave, where there's a vision there, and there's some money and dollars that are invested, and even though that's there, we need public support just as much as we need the resources too. So I'll throw that little tidbit too. All right, y'all. Well, again, uh, follow us on the project website, Rethinking Mobility WC. The survey's open through the end of this month. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. I'm going to leave some cards behind. Um, please let me know if you have any other questions, um, and we'll go from there. Thank you all for your time this morning. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ozzy. And, and we have a, a bit of a shorter program this morning. I'm sure there are no complaints there. Um, but uh, again, it gives you perhaps more opportunities to grab donuts and coffee in the back. But um, I did want to touch on for next five minutes or so before we conclude. Um, I want to give an update to this group because we did come to this group um, two months ago, I believe it was. We talked about the development, uh, uh, the Blueprint for, for Success, version two. Uh, that was a, a, a cumulative effort um, initiated almost three years ago, ultimately, by council, a council-led initiative that staff then picked up and ran with. Uh, ultimately, the, the, if I were to summarize, the, the goal was to improve the delivery of development services uh, to the community whether that be through permitting, through uh, technology, through counter experience, customer experience, customer service, all those were focal points. Um, we decided, or we, we heard from you, and we heard from staff, and we've heard from the commissions. We had a joint commission meeting at the end of May. Um, we heard that there's definitely interest in continuing that effort. We actually, as a staff, as, as a city staff, um, came up with a number of ideas that we are also I won't say giddy, but we are definitely encouraged by and would like to improve uh, our services and the delivery of those services. Um, so as part of the version two effort, uh, which we're in the process of right now, we're deep in the throes of feedback and now we're in the, in the uh, final stages of that feedback collection. Um, so we came here in April, got some feedback, valuable feedback. We appreciate those of you who participated and offered some feedback. Uh, we visited the Civic uh, Chambers, pardon me, um, the Chambers Civic Affairs Committee uh, we went to the Shadelands P bid and got feedback from the steering committee there. Worked with an ad hoc committee of the city council, including Mayor uh, Silva and, and um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Haskew. Uh, we visited, uh, Jessica Cole and I visited an architecture firm. Generally, we, we, we went down and, and went to the offices of uh, a local architecture firm to get some perspective from them. Um, we had an initial advisory group of some prominent voices, property owners, developers, and others that we revisited and touched bases with. Uh, recently, about a week and a half ago, I mentioned the Joint Commission meeting at the end of May. You get the point. We have been reaching out far and wide, casting a broad net, trying to gather as much information as possible. Um, and, and in fact, the reason Jessica Cole is not here is because she is talking to the Walnut Creek Downtown Board this morning, asking for their feedback for version two. So again, we're trying to make this a comprehensive effort. Um, similarly, we've gotten over 100 pieces of feedback. Um, broadly through through the process and some of which overlapped and so there was commonality and interests aligned which was great um, we're categorizing them broadly in the following three buckets if you will uh, entitlements which could be design review could be use permits there have been mention of all types of entitlements uh, the permitting process is a second bucket um, and then I guess a, a unified um, supportive customer experience so, so that is a broad catch-all kind of a category, but I think ultimately it gets, serves the main goal, improving customer service as well. And so we're working on that. So those are kind of our three categories, our three buckets, the three areas of interest for this next version. Um, we want to thank all of you for the feedback that has been provided, as I mentioned. It's been really valuable. We have seen among all those disparate groups, we've seen a lot of commonalities, a lot of alignment across those groups on issues that fall within those buckets, on entitlements, for example, design review and streamlining processes. So both on a staff level and in a development community level. Um, just in wrapping up, I want to say we appreciate the feedback you provided, but there's always an opportunity to gather that one last bit or something dawned on you this morning or in the shower a week ago or whatever. That said, we're going to send out a survey, a digital survey for you to fill out any last comments or, or passing thoughts, fleeting moments, um, because we're looking to complete the draft by July, because our thought is to take it to council then in August. So um, the council's interested in this. It's a priority for them. It's a priority for staff. 
you've clearly made it a priority by showing up and providing your feedback, and again, we appreciate that. Um, and I guess I would just close by saying, if, if anyone has something dawned on them, maybe after listening to the Rethinking Mobility piece, or if there are any other comments or thoughts you've had that you maybe didn't get a chance to share, I'm happy to hear them now or after the meeting. Um, but again, if I haven't said it before, thank you. Yeah, Kurt. One question I get from people coming in the area, and, it's, and I don't know the answer, are all the meters, uh, the rate, the same? In other words, they ask me, what will a quarter buy in a meter? And is it a different rate at a two-hour maximum versus a 10-hour? And I, I can't get the answer. I don't know what it is. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it's a good question. And what can a quarter buy you? Well, it depends where you're parking. Um, I guess I could say, it, literally, it depends. There, because there are zones. Yeah, so, and, and I will say, it's, this is not demand-based pricing. This is the first foray, the first attempt uh, by city staff to address what we recognize and heard from downtown business owners of, look, we've got our employees who park in the downtown, but they're the ones parking in front of the shop where they work. We'd love to have that available to our customers. We have, a, as a city, a goal of 85%. We, we want a lot of turnover, right, in these spots. But around the perimeter of downtown, and we've tried to demarcate them with literally a purple band around the pole. Purple poles are the 10-hour poles, and those are ideal if you happen to work downtown, and maybe it's only a block or two from your place of, of, of business or a place you're patronizing. Anyone is welcome to park there, but understanding that the price is adjusted accordingly, both to allow for a longer period of time, but also at a slightly reduced rate. You are gonna pay slightly more if you're trying to park right in front of Kara's Cupcakes, not to patronize or to single out a business, but for example, I've been there, my kids love, anyway, point is, there's a different price there, the idea is to create turnover and more opportunity for parking. Again, it's, it's almost to the perception of the availability of parking, which we've seen in these informal, non-scientific surveys, but just in meeting with the public. But to address around the perimeter, we're providing these purple poles for longer term parking. Does it, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So the rate is the and, and 25 I'm, cents. The 25 cents in a 10 hour area is cheaper. What would that buy you, 10 minutes or 15? Dollar an hour. At the cheaper, okay, the purple good. pole is a dollar an hour. And the yeah. only thing I was going to add to that is you have to be careful that there's also private meters. So there's private parking lots that have meters that aren't run by the city and they have a different rate. Oh, that's right. And so as a citizen, you wouldn't necessarily know that. Right. Um, and that is, that's a great segue. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, um, just to remind everyone that there are, there are literally 10,000 parking spaces downtown. 10,000. There are 10,000 parking spaces downtown. 70% of them are privately owned, to Heather's point, and therefore may have a different parking rate. And we have nothing to do with that. However, the 30%, the 3 out of 10, the city does control. And for those 3 out of 10, we've demarcated at least a portion of them around the perimeter at a discounted, relatively speaking, discounted rate for a longer period of time. So 10,000 spaces downtown, just highlighting that point. Um, I want to say thank you again and to say that uh, the process, we appreciate the feedback. There will be a digital survey. If something clicks or something occurs to you, please let us know. Uh, and just lastly to say that at each table there is a summary of Blueprint 1 if you're curious for a bit more information or if you'd like a copy of that document, we can send it out PDF via email. Just let me know. Uh, and last point, next month, July, we're taking off. I'm going on vacation personally, but um, for the rest of you, enjoy your, uh, the rest of your summer. Please stay cool, and thank you for attending this morning.